Things are going to be a little bit different this year, Tess. It's going to be a quiet one, Tomo. Not so fast, lads. I've got us a job. Paddy Power want us to do the new Christmas advert. Paddy Power? What? How's it come to this? All the sport in the telly this Christmas is a real gift. Sport is the gift that keeps on giving. And you can make the most of all that sport with Paddy Power. How embarrassing. Totally worth it for this. What have we become? Chin up. Tis the season to be jolly. Merry Christmas, lads. Dear, oh dear. How has it come to this? Matt Letizia, hello. <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> Uh, the good news is, I'm told there's even more of those coming your way on the uh, Paddy Power social channels, and uh, people can check them out. For information on responsible gambling, do visit gamblingcare.ie or dunlouis.net. So there's more coming our way. Yes, uh, we had a lot of fun uh, filming the Christmas ad, but we've also uh, done a few more episodes of the uh, of the pundits, which we did a, a couple of months back, and uh, they went down very well. Uh, <laughs> very funny, and uh, and I think personally, having filled them. I think this next lot are even funnier than the last lot. So, I mean, look, there's an elephant in the room there. I, how long were you on Soccer Saturday? Uh, 15 years. 15. And total mm. shock this summer when you got the news? Um, yeah, a little bit of a shock. Um, but, you know, all good things come to an end and these things happen for a reason. Uh, and, yeah, that's just part of life. You know, I had a good, a good innings of 15 years and mm. uh, never would have thought that when I first started. So, uh, yeah, onwards and upwards. You, uh, I mean, you're in two brutal worlds, football and media. They're both ruthless and <laughs> the end is never pretty. Uh, that's very true, that's very true. But I've also never, ever got carried away with my position in either. Mm. Yeah, it, it, yeah, I mean, you had a really enjoyable run. That show, at its peak, uh, seemed to really capture the imagination. Uh, you guys obviously had a great chemistry. And also, I think, and it's, it's far less so the case uh, today, the three o'clock games, there were actually quite a few of them, and they were generally pretty good, so people wanted to know what was going on. Frankly, that's just not the case as much anymore. No, it's been very difficult, I think, for, uh, for the guys this season on the, on the show because they don't have, you know, those amounts of three o'clock kickoffs in the Premier League. You know, we only get one every... Saturday afternoon, and you're looking at the, the three championship games uh, after that. Um, and it's also obviously very difficult when you've got people in different studios trying to knit it all together. So it's been a tough job for Jeff as well. Because mm. the whole point is that you're within touching distance of each other and you know it's, it's interaction. Now, that's exactly right. And I think that's what the show was kind of built on, really, was the, was the camaraderie and the, uh, and the arguments that we would sometimes get into over... Uh, certain issues in football and certain decisions that we disagreed with and um, and yeah and it was instantaneous you know you're in the same studio and you're able to react uh, and people could see that and, uh, and I think that's what people enjoyed. Yes and so uh, was media a thing when you retired that you were dead set on doing or did you think about management in any great way did you just sort of fall into it? Um, <laughs> yeah I kind of did just fall into it really I had no real plans when I retired I've, I've never really been one for, for making big long-term plans you know I've just gone gone with the flow throughout my life and uh, seen what comes up and um, yeah I think the, the media thing kind of fell into my lap a little bit I enjoyed it I was comfortable with it um, and it, it just it kind of snowballed really and uh, yeah I, I enjoyed every minute of it mm. which probably makes the next question redundant if you don't make big plans I was <laughs> gonna say are you what, what's the plan now are you, are you hoping to keep involved and keep doing bits or, or are you, you calling it a day or what's the thinking uh no i'm still um, still doing some uh media work with other tv companies that, that have the premier league coverage abroad um so i've done some work um with uh, mola tv who cover the premier league out in indonesia um uh, and i've also uh done a couple of um matches on zoom for uh for malaysian tv as well so right. uh it's um, it's been interesting uh, trying to trying to do punditry on Zoom is a is a little bit different, but it, it kind of works, and uh, you know it also has the benefit of of doing it from your uh, from your living room. Yeah, the commutes lie a lot better. The jet lag ain't so bad. So, uh, <laughs> what about the uh, nature of punditry? It does seem to have changed a lot in the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years. The analysis that people want, uh, you know, is of a certain standard. You know, they want cliches are out. They want data-driven points made, they want to be shown stuff they can't see at home. And, obviously, and I think as well the footballing audience is just a lot more educated because there are so many games on. Yeah, I think that's a, a fair point. I think um, the game has gone more and more towards uh, data and, and statistics. 
um, which, you know, has been, I, I think a lot of that has been good for the game. I think there's some of it that's a, a little bit irrelevant at times in mm. terms of in terms of the statistics. Um, uh, and, you know, there, there is still, um, certainly I, I feel there's still room for being able to watch a football match uh, and say what you feel is happening uh, as opposed to uh, micro-analyzing it and, uh, and looking at everybody's positions. Um, mm. I still kind of, I still tend to watch football matches from the from the view of a fan, um, uh, and and I like to be able to do that, and then to to pass on my knowledge of things that perhaps uh, the fans might not have spotted during the game. So there's lots of games coming up, and then obviously we're into the festive period where it goes uh, bananas. So. Arsenal against Southampton tomorrow catches the eye. We just had Ray Parler on, and obviously Arsenal are not in a great place. They're in 15th. They're feeling a little bit vulnerable. The Southampton thing this year has really taken off and turned around. For a time over the weekend, they were in third. They're currently in fourth. Uh, Ralph Hasselhuttle is, uh, seems to be doing a phenomenal job. I mean, take you back to 9-0 against Leicester last year. This was not on the card, so you'll need to explain what's happened here. I've seen the change in results, but in, in terms of what Hasselhuttle has done with the team, I mean, he looked like dead man walking for a start. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think many a club would would probably have got shot of their manager after a, a, a result like that. Um, but the great thing about the, the board at Southampton is they they didn't panic. Um, they still believed in their manager, um, and long term, you know, it, it's proved to be the right decision. I think he he's turned things around incredibly. Uh, the players have to take a lot of credit as well. They've taken on board. His ideas. They've found a formation that suits the players that he's got, and everybody seems to know what their job is in that formation, and it causes teams a lot of problems, you know. But football is cyclical, and, and at some point, you know, teams will work out a way to play against that system, and you'll have to change again because that's what happens in football. Mm. It evolves. Mm. And what is the current system that's serving them so well? Uh, so they've <laughs> they've played with a, a back four. Um, they've got two solid midfielders in James Ward-Prowse and. Oriel Romeo, uh, who have been outstanding this season, a pair of them. Um, and then the two wide men uh, tend to drift inside a little bit. And it's almost like a 4-2-2-2 formation that, that Ralph likes to call it. Um, uh, and the players just play that formation well, but they also have an incredible work rate uh, and a drive and a desire to go and hunt down the ball when they lose it. And uh, this season so far, it's, it's worked incredibly well. Ward Prowse's delivery is quite something as well. Mm. Yeah, he's been outstanding. I mean, we've known for many years that uh, his delivery from set pieces is good. Um, he's taken it up a notch with the amount of goals that he's now scoring from from direct free kicks. Uh, I think he always had that potential when you saw uh, the way that he can deliver a ball, uh, and he's managed to work that in. But, you know, it's only the last probably three years or so that he's really established himself as a as a first team regular at Santa. You know, he was kind of in and out the team for quite a few years. Mm. You know, a couple of the managers came in, you know, didn't really have that belief in him. But I think his game has gone up a, a level since Ralph Hasnoodle uh, came to the club. And I think Ralph has had a, a big impact on that because he he's asked things of of Prousey that perhaps other managers before didn't. And Prousey has taken it on board and uh, and it's just been phenomenal the way that his game has improved. Hassan Huddle is the kind of manager where you could watch match of the day each week for years on end and have no feel for. You know, he gives very little away, quietly spoken, <laughs> doesn't lose his temper. Can you give us an insight into what he's like? I'm sure you've maybe heard through the grapevine what his approach is. Uh, yeah, no, I've met Ralph uh, a, a number of times. Uh, and he, he's always struck me as a, as a very calm individual, um, but very driven, very focused. He, he, he leaves no stone on turn his attention to detail is is excellent um and i think he, he also used the period of time in lockdown to to actually write a whole book on uh, uh on how he thinks that the football club should be run and how each team should play um uh, and you know he just loves the game of football he's uh, he just absorbs himself in the game of football and uh, and i think we're very lucky to have him at southampton right and do you mean that literally he's written a book during lockdown on football clubs uh, he wrote a book for Southampton Football. It's not okay. a book that's been published, but he wrote uh, he, he wrote quite a, a detailed um, a book on how he thinks the football club should be run okay. uh, and how each coach needs to needs to work with the players and the and the system that they want to be playing. 
Um, and I haven't seen the the book, but I was I was told about it and was led to believe it was you know, pretty in depth. Wow! Suddenly uh, feeling what I already knew, which is I wasted my lockdown time. By, uh, <laughs> you and me both <laughs> doing not very much. Uh, that that is very impressive. It must be great for the area. Are you still down in that neck of the woods? Yeah. Yeah, I am indeed. Yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, just on the outskirts of Southampton, just outside of a um, little town called Romsey. Um, and so, yeah, it takes me about 25 minutes to get back into the stadium. Okay. And are they, I mean, I know Portsmouth are in the area as well, but is that like a one town club, Southampton are almost the beating heart of it? Is that the nature of a town there? Yeah, very much so. I mean, it's, it's 20 miles um, to, uh, to Portsmouth, one side of us, uh, and about 25, 30 miles to Bournemouth, the other side. But Portsmouth, Portsmouth has always been the, the, the big local derby. Um, but Southampton has always been kind of the, the team to beat down here. Mm. Southampton, uh, for a time, you know, things went very well. And then obviously there was your era, which was uh, very memorable. And then there was a yo-yo thing going on and there were some good years and some bad periods. It was hard to know on the outside what way it was going to go. You know, were they going to languish in a championship or league one type situation? And goodness me, they've turned it around and they now feel firmly part of the Premier League. That fork in the road, what, what has dictated, Matt, that they went the right way? Is it an owner or a manager or, or what happened that has kind of led them to this stage? Yeah, I think, uh, I think there was a, a, a crucial appointment probably of, um, of Nigel Adkins, um, who uh, got us successive promotions, um, which, uh, which was just a phenomenal achievement to go from where we were. Mm. Um, and yes, we, we had a, a pretty big budget. Um, so the, the Lee Bear family came in and, uh, and injected a fair bit of money into the club, you know, for, for a club at League One level in the championship was, you know, a pretty sizable budget to work with. But, uh, but I thought the job that Nigel Adkins did as a manager um, to galvanise those players and that squad, uh, I thought was uh, absolutely phenomenal. And he'll be hailed as a hero forever down in these parts of the world. But I think he also had a couple of really key players um, from that squad that came up from League One. Uh, you know, we ended up selling quite a lot of them for, for quite a lot of money, but mm. um, Adam Alana and Ricky Lambert, I thought were outstanding. And then you had Morgan Schneidlin um, patrolling the midfield uh, and Jose Fonts at the back. Um, and it was a real solid spine to the team. And it, uh, uh, and it, and it was really a, a great couple of years. Those two back-to-back -back promotions, I think, will be spoken about amongst our fans for many, many years to come. Right, OK, yeah, because it feels pretty stable now. It feels like the club's in a really strong place. It is pretty stable, you know. It's uh, we've had a couple of, uh, of uh, relegation scraps, which you know um, almost took me back to my time at the football <laughs> club. Um, but you know, before that, we had uh, we had a, a fair number of seasons in a row where we finished in the, in the top ten mm. of European football. So uh, it was a, a little blip along the way, but um, Ralph seems to have been putting us back to where we kind of were uh, under Ronald Koeman. Yeah. Uh, in your day with those relegation scraps, were they just stress all the way and horrible periods and it was all you could think about or was it, did you kind of get used to it? Um, I, I guess you kind of got used to it. I mean, it wasn't every season. Sure. Uh, I did have a couple of seasons where I finished in the top half, but yeah, there was, there was probably three or four that were quite nail-biting on the last day of the season. And you could say it was a bit stressful, but I actually, I actually quite enjoyed it. Um, in, a, in a perverse sort of hmm. way, um, you know, uh, we were always kind of the underdogs because we, you know, we had one of the smallest grounds in the Premier League, but probably the smallest budget in the Premier League. Uh, so it was always a, a, a bit of an effort to to stay up at times. But um, no, I, I enjoyed the challenge of it, and uh, and those those last day escapes were uh, were fond memories in the end. Hmm. I saw a quote from Xavi, by the way. I presume you've seen this, have you? Have you heard this? I have. Yes. Yeah. This, I mean, this is kind of a mad one. This is a couple of years ago, but I was just uh, reading different bits and bobs this morning. No, it's about 10 years ago, actually. <laughs> is it 10? Okay. Yeah, I think it was just before the 2010 World Cup it was. Right, okay, maybe it was. He was 36 when he said it anyway, so maybe. Um, in Catalonia, there used to be a half-hour programme every Monday where they'd show the best goals from the Premier League. Every week, Matt Letizia would be on this show. Now, I'm talking outrageous, sickening goals. Our whole house was obsessed with Matt Letizia. I mean, that's a nice one to have. That's a nice one to have. Beamed across yeah. Spain back in the day. Uh, what was it with you and those spectacular goals? I'm sure you're asked about that a lot. Uh, they, I mean, I, who knows what happens in those moments? You're probably not thinking too consciously a lot of the time. <laughs> no, I mean, 
whenever I was on the football pitch, especially when I was in the final third of the football pitch, um, my my overriding first thought when a ball came anywhere near me is, uh, how can I get myself in a position to shoot? Um, uh, so I was always obsessed with trying to score goals and trying to create goals. Um, so I got myself into positions. I played in a in a position. Uh, where it allowed me to be kind of 25, 30 yards from goal in a bit of space. Um, and I was able to, I had the ability to to shoot pretty accurately with quite a lot of power from from distance. So, uh, so yeah, that's probably why I had a, a probably a bigger share of my goals from outside the box than, than most players. Yeah, I mean, well, look, they were phenomenal. There was definitely a, a DVD or a videotape, giving away both our ages here, uh, but I had it was it was in our house as well of all your best goals. And I think was it Newcastle where you flicked it over a couple of players? There were, you know, there were all these kind of yes. different types of goals. And um, when you look at modern day pitches, modern day tackling, um, do you suspect you might have enjoyed your football more in the current era, or would you know the, the diet and all that kind of miserable stuff would have been a little bit of a straitjacket for you? Yeah, I mean, the fitness levels might be a little bit different now. Um, but, you know, had I grown up in this era, I, I probably w would have fallen into that and, and would have had to have um, gone along with those regimes and, and, and did sort my diet out and eat properly and, uh, and be a bit fitter than I was. Um, however, I don't think, you know, even with the sums of money that are involved now, I, I, I'm not sure I would change the era that I played in. I loved it. Right. Uh, you know, we, we played on those muddy pitches. You know, we played with with defenders who were who were looking to give you a bit of a kick, and had you know they had, they had a free go because the referee didn't want to get the yellow card out too soon in games. Uh, and so you had to put up with all that, and uh, and you know it's character building, you know? and, yeah. and you learn to live with it, and and it just makes your achievements all the greater when you have to cope with all that stuff and still be able to, you know, stick the ball in the top of top of the uh, top corner from twenty five yards. Your penalty record was fairly ridiculous as well. So, what was the technique or what was the thought process? Um, again, I, I was fortunate. I was able to side foot the ball quite powerfully. Um, so, that kind of helped in keeping the accuracy of my penalties. Um, so, I never went down the middle. I always just picked uh, one side or the other. And, and I, I hit, hit the ball nice and firm with the side foot. Knowing that you know, if I, I've got it somewhere near the corner, the goalkeeper would have to move pretty early to try and to try and stop it. And I also kept my eye on the goalkeeper as long as I could. Uh, and sometimes he would move too early, and I was able to to change my mind at the last minute and, and and put the ball the other way. Right. Okay. So you would change your mind if you saw the keeper move, and that was obviously very doable. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's it's something that's probably wouldn't suit everybody. Mm. Um, I think you have to be quite flexible in your thinking. Um, and quite quite calm under pressure, uh, and that's kind of the attributes that I had. So although I picked a corner that I wanted to, to score in, um, you know, that would only be my decision made perhaps 95%. You know, I'd keep right. a, a little bit open just in case I saw the goalie move that way. So away from Southampton and their brilliant season at the moment, what are you making of this rather strange Premier League season? Um... I'm enjoying it. Um, you know, I think it's it's nice to see different teams up in a, up near the top challenge. You know, Southampton even spent a few hours on top of the Premier League this season, which was which was amazing. You know, and, and you've got teams like Leicester and West Ham up there. You know, and at the moment, after eleven or twelve games, you've still got Manchester United, Manchester City, Arsenal, all outside the the top seven places in the Premier League. So um, I, I think it's good for the for the Premier League. I think it's nice to have some different names. Uh, in and around those European places. Do you think it's down to scheduling? Are the top players just wrecked? I think there's probably a combination of things. Um, I, I think the the bigger teams, obviously, with European football, are going to find it um, a, a little bit tougher because they're not going to get that break when, when the other teams in the Premier League who aren't involved in European football are getting it. Um, so there, there's definitely an argument for that. Um, I think having no fans in the stadium has probably also affected results somewhat. Um, and I think that's something else that has to be taken into consideration. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's going to be a quite a strange season. But, you know, I, I think it's just been some phenomenal results so far. I mean, who would have thought that Liverpool would have gone to Aston Villa and got beaten seven goals to two? Mm. Um, you know, when that kind of result happens, it, it just kind of makes you think, wow, you know, 
anything can still happen on a given day. Um, and that's why we, we love our football so much. Yeah, the no fans thing is, is stark. And uh, like sometimes I will flick to the option which gives you the actual sound of the stadium as opposed to the fake crowd noise. Now in the main I watch with fake crowd noise because it's, it's tough going actually without them but you, you almost it's worth flicking on from time to time to remind yourself just what it's like for the players just how soulless it can feel in those stadiums it can't be very enjoyable so what effect do you think that's having on results then you said that's part of it like it's how you've been there you know what it's like to have a crowd what effect is, is their absence having do you suspect um I, I certainly think that the the effect of the crowds would have a difference on the away teams um simple as that i mean you know, I mean, back in my day, you, you'd go to Anfield with, uh, you know, a full stadium there. And you, you're almost 1-0 down before you start playing. You know, it, you know, you're in, the intimidation factor is there. And some players are just, that I don't think they'll ever admit it, um, but some players will be more comfortable playing in front of an empty stadium. Mm. Um, and, and I think there are players that have benefited from that. And their performances have, have gone up a couple of levels from, from when they're actually playing in front of fans. Akin to the player who was very good in training and couldn't produce it on match day. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess a little bit like that. Yeah, I, I would say so. You liked crowds? Loved it. Bigger the crowd, the better. Right. I was a big head. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to show off in front of these people type attitude? Yes, that, that's exactly what it was. You know, I loved I loved entertaining. Not so much show off. I loved entertaining people. Mm. I loved doing stuff that that drew applause from people and that and that got them on the edge of their seats and just just I just wanted to to put a smile on people's faces, really. And so, if a ball came to you and you gave a nice little one touch flick pass to another player and you heard a murmur of appreciation from the crowd, you were hearing the crowd. You were noticing that, were you? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Any player who says he, he doesn't. <laughs> listen to the crowd noises is a liar okay. uh, you don't normally get you don't normally you don't always hear the individual um stuff uh but you know if, if as a collective something has happened that's that's really good and, and it gets a ripple uh you you definitely can't ignore that yeah must be a lovely feeling to be in control of that many people um yeah well i, I wouldn't say in control of them but but have the ability to to uh, put a smile on their faces is, is something that was pretty special, yeah. Mm. What were the Southampton crowd like when you were playing? Uh, they were always great to me. Um, they really were. I mean, there were other players at the club who would probably say something completely different, mm. uh, who were picked on at times, perhaps, as, as you get with most football fans. Um, but even you know, from a really young age of, of 17, when I made my debut, the crowd were, were really good to me. And they were one of the reasons why I, I stayed at Southampton my whole career. You know, I, I I always felt the love from them, and that made a decision. That made a, an impact on my decision to stay. Would you have been aware? You know, so they're picking on other players. Maybe there's uh, murmurs or boos when that player touches the ball, or maybe you hear some shouts. The other nine, ten, eleven players are generally aware that's going on, are they? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, you do, and and you know that's something that will again is is kind of character building if you can turn it round. Um, and I played with a few players who did, you know, who weren't the crowd favourites, but um, by just pure hard work and determination and mental strength, mm. uh, they turned the they turned the opinion of the fans around. And that's that's a lovely thing to see as well. Who'd be an example of that who came through it well? Um, I would say probably Franny Benali, who's my, one of my closest mates, would probably be a, an example of that because, um, you know, his distribution with the ball wasn't always great. and. There's a lot of murmurings when, you know, he would slice the ball out of play. Um, but eventually, uh, he made up th for that through sheer hard work, determination. And those fans knew that every week Franny Benali was on the pitch, he wouldn't leave that pitch without giving his all mm. for that shirt. Mm. Uh, and, and they eventually saw that um, uh, and could live with the mistakes because of that. Yeah. Probably less kind to name names for this question, but you must have seen players who didn't manage to turn around, who almost went under or went into their shells because of it, and, and like, totally understandable. Yeah, no, it would it, it would be completely understandable. You have to have a real certain type of mentality to to be able to turn that situation around, you know. And it's not for everyone, um, and you know that's no criticism. It's sure. just that's just the way people are. Um, but yeah, there would be there would be players that, that won't be able to turn that around and will have to eventually leave the football club and try and start a, a fresh start somewhere else and, and hope to get off to a, 
a better start and have the crowd on their side. Yeah. I don't think the crowd sometimes realises just how much they can influence uh, the, the standard of play from one of the footballers just by how they react to them. Right. As in, especially maybe more the more creative types, they try something, it doesn't come off, and then they get yeah, there. Um, yeah, very much so, very much so. And that was, a, that was one of the good things I had. I, I had the backing of the crowd, so I never felt like I didn't want to try something or else I'd get, I'd get booed or, or you know, it's, yes. I, I always felt like they were on my side, and, and that's a big thing. And that's kind of, I guess, why um, I, I kind of reached the levels that I did in the, in the creativity and the goals that I scored. Yes, you had license, encouragement even. Yes, absolutely. That's exactly the right way to put it. Yeah, because sometimes over here, you know, Aidan McGeady, Republic of Ireland International, he's trying things. We're not the most creative team in the world. Often it's, you know, fairly drab football and then ball out to McGeady on the wing and it's like, well, he's got to try something. And if it doesn't uh, come it, off, there'd be a degree of... Uh, no, that, that's exactly right. And, and, you know, the creative players do feel um, a, a pressure on them to do that, especially if they're in a minority of one in that team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, you know some, a lot of teams might have three or four players who can do something a little bit different and, and create something. But if you've got a, 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 a quite a mundane team and a team of, of hard-working players, if you've just got the one player who everyone looks to for that flash of inspiration, that's quite a lot to put on your shoulders. Mm. You obviously think as, as many England caps as a lot of players, uh, fellow players even, not just onlookers, think you should have had. From your observations of England, did that you know, generation who were full of talent, you know, they didn't seem to express themselves on the international stage as much. The, the crowd seemed, and the tabloids and the pressure, that seemed to be a thing with English teams for a long time. Yeah, I think there's probably a, a combination of things. I think the, the, the media played a big part in in that, in terms of not really making the flat players feel that comfortable um, uh, and also putting managers under pressure. Mm. You know, I think managers felt the pressure not to pick um, the, the, you know, too many talented players in one team because, you know, it, it, we're England and we work hard and we, you know, we, we're organised and, and it was that kind of mentality, really. Um, uh, and it was a shame because there was a lot of talented players in the 90s and we really should have done better with the, the talent that we had available. Mm. Um, I wasn't going to ask the most cliched question you can ask, Matt uh, Letizia, but you sort of mentioned one of the reasons you never left was because of the crowd and you were happy there. I never, one, the other reason I wasn't going to ask it, the, I never sense any regret on your part. You seem totally happy with the career you had and fulfilled and enjoyed it and there's no longing there in your part to wonder what it might have been like in a bigger pond. No, absolutely not. No, I've I've always uh, I've always said I've no regrets about my career, and if I had the chance to do it all again, I'd, I'd probably pick the same route. So um, so yeah, I'm I'm very very happy with the way things turned out. Yes, I would have have loved to have had more England caps. You know, that's the one thing I look back and perhaps go, yeah, that would have been nice. Uh, however, I'm also mature enough to understand that that that's not in my core. You know, I did the best I could do. I played the best I could for my team. And if that wasn't good enough for the manager, then then so be it, you know. And and that's something that I, I reconciled quite a long time ago. And uh, and you know, I I understand it was it was out of my hands. So it's okay to be disappointed. Sure. But it's not a regret. You don't have that much control over it. And we, so it would have been what Hoddle territory, maybe a bit of Graham Taylor. Uh, did they uh, ever? Did, yeah. So did they I, ever chat I with was, you and say, look, this is the, this is the story, Matt. You're not in because X, Y, and Z, or is it, it, it? Does that communication even happen? Um, no, not really. Uh, I think um, I had uh, Graham Taylor put me into the into the first England squad, um, which I sat on the bench for the game when Alan Shearer made his debut and scored. Hmm. Uh, I didn't get on that day, so I didn't uh, make my debut then until a couple of years later when Terry Venables was manager, and I, I got a few caps under Terry, yeah. uh, and then a couple of caps under under Glenn. But both times, you know, I, I was dropped without uh, without any explanation at all really yeah it's funny man it's, you know we talked to a bunch of former players on the show and the standard of man management at times seems very average you know that they've experienced that like simple conversations like that just whatever weird way football worked it was just like well son i'm the boss you you know i don't owe you an explanation and i don't know it's, yeah. it's, when you think about it now it's kind of an odd way of doing things isn't it it, it is really um it, not even when you're thinking about it now it was, <laughs> I, I remember thinking back then that you know you got to be a man about it. Surely you can look someone in the eye and tell them why you're not picking them and, and why they're not in the squad. You know that's. But 
you know, that was the way. It was, you know, yeah. he, he was the boss and, and you just took his word for it and got on with it. And Simple as that. Were you a knock on the manager's office type? No, no, I never did that. Um, I uh, would be, I think my, whenever I got dropped, my first thought would be, uh, I will just um, be better in training um, and I will go back and do extra training. Um, and uh, I will make sure that the manager sees that I'm, I'm still here and when the time comes and the team have lost a few games in a row and he's under pressure. I was I was always lucky in that the fans always wanted me in the team. Mm. So if I was dropped from the team and we didn't win a couple of games, there was a lot of pressure on the manager to, to get me back in the team. Mm. So I always kind of had that in my favour. You were, I mean, slightly unlucky in the era that we're talking about as well. Like the quality of English strikers or attacking players then was fairly ridiculous. Mm. Yeah, there was. I mean... That's a, that's kind of when people say, oh, you, you should have got more than eight caps. I think there was quite a few players around that time yeah. who you could also look at who were incredibly talented and scored a lot of goals. Uh, and, and again, only got a, a handful of England caps. Um, but, you know, when you're, when you're trying to wrestle people like uh, Paul Gascoigne and Teddy Sheringham and Alan Shearer out of the team, <laughs> um, you know, you're going to have to be pretty special. It's true. I mean, we could have this same chat with who? Robbie Fowler, Ian Rice... Um, Absolutely, Les Ferdinand, Les Ferdinand, you know, Andy Cole. Like there's, there's quite, I, there's quite yeah. a few there who were racking up high twenties Premier League goals a season every year. No, absolutely, and there's some some very talented players there in in the number ten position as well. You know, you had, you had the likes of Peter Beardsley, who was mm. a fantastic footballer. Um, so yeah, it wasn't uh, it wasn't easy to to <laughs> fight your way in. So uh, so I yeah, I was proud of those eight caps, but. Would have, would have loved to have been more, but I could understand to a point why it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did we get onto that tangent? Crowds. Crowds, I think, took us there. <laughs> right, yeah. So, so uh, who's going to win this very strange league then without the crowds for a lot of the season to finish up, Matt? How do you see things? Um, I, I hope we see a different named winner on the Premier League title this season. I think... The more different winners you can get in the Premier League, I think the better the reputation of the league becomes. So Spur um, Spurs are about your best bet then, aren't they? So Spurs would be uh, my best bet at the moment. Obviously, Southampton are only two points behind, so uh, <laughs> can, that, would, that would be even better. Can, I mean, they, can, South, can, South, can Southampton hang on to top four, five, you know, Europa League, certainly? is That, that feels realistic-ish. Um, I mean, at this stage of the season, they, they've done very well. I mean, mm. it, it can change very quickly. Um, in fact... After two games of the season, if you'd have spoken to any Southampton fan, I think most of them would have gone, Phew, this is going to be a long season. We could be in for a relegation fight here. Okay. So because we lost we lost away at Palace the first game of the season, played very poorly. Yeah. And then Tottenham came to our place and smashed five passes. So, um, you know, that is that, that was uh, a, a tricky start. But the game since then, uh, you know, have been, you know, apart from throwing away the two-goal lead at Man United... Um, it has been incredibly impressive. Yeah, OK, so that's a polite hold your horses there on Southampton for a minute. So um, <laughs> can Spurs hang on? I mean, Jose's doing his thing, obviously, and they all seem to be lapping it up. And if Kane and Son stay fit, they'll be tough to beat. But I, I just a sense Liverpool will click, isn't there? I, I would imagine so. You know, for, for Liverpool to have not really hit top gear yet and to only be behind Spurs on goal difference, um, I think you'd probably have to say Liverpool were still favourites uh, for this season, even without... You know, Virgil van Dijk, the problems have had at centre back with the injuries, and yet they're still sat in that position um, is, a, is a pretty cool achievement. OK, well, listen, we will see how it goes. It's good to have football back, at least in these strange times. Uh, Matt Letizia, Indeed. thanks so much. Have a nice Christmas. Enjoy the football. Lovely, you too. Cheers. That is uh, Matt Letizia with us this evening. A uh, chance to enter our competition now, uh, celebrating Paddy's week-long session. We're giving away 12 Paddy Power hampers. Each one includes chocolate, socks, hoodie, all sorts of goodies to be in with a chance of winning. Just identify our mystery voice, he says. Once the lights go on, Nathan Murphy is a different animal. As soon as the music for the intro is finished, <laughs> he literally turns it to another person. Text your name and answer, 53106 for 30 cents, and we'll contact you later on today. Remember, you must be over 18 to enter. It's all thanks to Paddy's week-long session. For information on responsible gambling, visit gamblingcare.ie, or you can check out as well dunlewey.net, D-U-N-L-E-W-E-Y.net is the uh, place to go. So end is along very shortly with the Paddy Power Half Hour. And then later on, 
for uh, our football show as part of uh, this evening's special show. Jermaine Pennant is going to be our uh, special guest. We'll chat to him about his career. Interesting to say the least. As a 15-year-old, I'm sure lots of you know and remember, as a 15-year-old he was signed by Arsenal for £2 million. It was a record. Made his debut Ar Arsenal's youngest ever player at the time. And things just uh, didn't quite happen in a host of ways uh, for him. He did obviously play in the Champions League final for Liverpool, but there were plenty of off-the-field troubles as well. So that should be a really interesting chat with Jermaine Penn coming up later on.